Um, yeah, Dr. Tamara Schneider is uh, an art historian and lecturer at Doshisha University and Kyoto Women's University in Kyoto. Uh, currently, she is working on contemporary artist uh, response to natural disasters. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, and also, thank you very much for your coming. Can you hear me? I'm talking loud enough? Okay, yes, so uh, as you just heard, uh, I'm an art historian, so I'm not a philosopher, so I'm also, yeah, a little bit worried to get into the, into a discussion because I'm not really trained in doing these discussions, but I try my best, okay? Uh, so, and, um, yes, uh, I wrote my PhD thesis on Japanism, uh, and while I was doing this, I worked in several museums. After that, I went to Japan, and now uh, I'm teaching uh, yeah, a, a culture and art history and also a German language at Doshisha University and Kyoto Women's University. And I just recently started my research on contemporary artists' response to natural disasters. So these are my first results I want to present to you. Uh, how do I... Do, do I use this too? Or, no, no, I can use the computer. So, okay. Ah, okay. Yes. yes. Uh, maybe we can turn out the lights in the front. Yes, this is better maybe, so you can see the slides better. Okay, so uh, today uh, I want to talk about transitions after destruction, the artistic response to the 2011 triple catastrophe in Japan. Mm -hmm. okay. <coughs> so, Japan has a long history of coping with natural disasters such as earthquakes, volcanic eruptions or typhoons. In the well-known ukiyo behind the big wave of Kanagawa from the early 19th century, uh, by Hokusai, you see the strong relation between human beings and nature as also an elementary threat. So here you see the strong relation between human beings and nature. Destroying but also soothing elements of nature can be seen. The threatening wave is contrasted with the calm, changeless Mount Fuji. In addition to that, the daily struggle of man is pointed out. In this struggle, human beings can go beyond their abilities towards the quest of the breaking waves, which are an enormous threat for the people in these wooden boats. So, transients, uh, and with this, transitions are depicted here. Climate change is one of the most dramatic geophysical transitions processes of our times. So as you can see in the following graphs, we have a transition towards a dramatic increase of temperature all over the world. With climate change, natural disasters will become more frequent and impacts on society more severe. Here you see selected significant climate anomalies and events in 2015. The speed of these changes or transitions caused by climate change has rapidly increased. Natural disasters like droughts, floods and storms, like uh, yeah, Japan just experienced again this week uh, with a typhoon, will become more frequent and impacts on society more severe. 
So in the best case, this will cause only economical um, damages, but it also causes hunger, migration and death. So I wish we would have had the uh, other presenter, he was or supposed to talk about migration, but yeah. Um, yes, extreme weather events become the rule, like the one Japan experienced this early summer with heavy rain and uh, floodings. So here you see a flooded area in Hiroshima. And also the entire northern hemisphere experienced with an at least three months drought. So here you see um, a fire we had in Berlin last month. <clears throat> so climate change is a high-speed geophysical transition. As emphasized by the IPCC, so this is the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, or in German also der Weltklimarat, uh, and I just explain it for you because maybe not all of them are fam familiar with this, they summarize all scientific evidences concerning climate change. So as emphasized by the IPCC, any adaptation to these events significantly benefits from ta taking social, cultural contexts and social values into consideration, so also reaction patterns. And as I already said, or we unfortunately have to experience right now again, uh, Japan has a long history of coping with natural disasters. <clears throat> So also the most recent March 2011 triple catastrophe had dramatic impacts on Japanese society. The creation of artworks and the expression of sentiments through art is one way of coping with traumatic experiences like this. In this presentation I talk about two Japanese contemporary artists and their works dealing with the March 2000 triple catastrophe. So, I just need mm. So the disaster modified the artist's approach to art creation. Yeah. Born in post-war Japan, Takashi Murakami was mainly occupied with critical thinking about his generation. Motifs derived from everyday culture. He calls his artwork super flat with this title, he refers to the two-dimensional optical perspective on the one hand, but also to the lack of reflection on society with, within his generation on the other hand. The shock of the disaster, however, prompted Murakami to reassess his own artistic and spiritual position. He finally understood that people needed storytelling or need storytelling and religion, so something to believe in. He intended to give explanations and hope by referring to tradition. Atsunobu Katagiri was born in Osaka in 1973. He expressed his very own feelings through his flower arrangements and he is known for his combination of tradition with modern art and he often worked with cherry blossoms. Arriving at the area of disaster, he had the urgent need to express the sentiment of the area. He intended to do this at the very site of disaster and he only wanted to use material and flowers he could find on the site. The 
The following quotes support these changes in their art production. So Murakami said in 2015, uh, I quote, I think I was able to gain some understanding of what I had previously wondered. The reason why people desire storytelling and religion after the experience of the 2011 quake. And in the same year, Katagiri wrote, from then on, I was to empty my body and mind so that I could filter the disgrace, the grief, the sorrow, and the modest joy that shines through their cracks and turn them into flowers. Was I capable of such a thing? So, with their artworks, these artists identify different options for social transitions. So societal transitions, we have two options. The Ahats as providers of moral guidance and hope in Murakami's 500 Ahats and the natural circle of life with uh, Katagiri's sacrifice. How do Murakami's Ahats support transitions in society? The 500 Ahats is an oversized painting, three meters in height, one meter in length. It is broken down into four parts. It shows a detailed description of the 500 Ahats, some of them in small scale at the bottom of the painting, others in supernatural size. The large Ahats belong to the a yeah, well-known group of the 16 Ahats. So here you can see Pantaka with a paper scroll. He makes judgment of a value. Mm, you can see him right in the middle. Uh, the grotesque-looking 500 figures of the Ahats are interspersed with depictions of sacred beasts and mythical creatures. So on the left-hand side you see Baku, who devours nightmares, he's a mixture of different animals. The background gives a first structure, a structuring orientation. So it subdivides the artwork into four panels. They can be distinguished by their coloring, ochre, yellowish, red, blue and black. The four panels are attributed to the four deities that govern the four cardinal directions in Chinese mythology. <coughs> One example is the Azure Dragon of the East. The light ochre yellowish panel of the Azure Dragon is associated with abstract swirling wind and wave motifs. The dragon looks very confused, fallen with his muscle, lying flat on the ground, incapable of any further actions. The symbol for the south is the vermilion bird and appears in the phoenix design. The rather dark black and blue panel is associated with the universe, the Ahats sit in meditation on the surface of water. Based on the Chinese mythology, the background color are in complete disorder. Here, for instance, we have the color of the black turtle of the north. The white tiger has the background of the vermilion bird and the azure dragon, the background color of the white tiger. So the world seems to be in total chaos. We can find hope 
and the presentation of the Ahats. On the left hand side, in the blue gown, we see the ninth of the 16 Ahats. Jivaka, he carries a fan, a ritual implement that can reduce the affliction of nescience. So you understand the concept, each of, them, each of them has its supernatural power. The white elephant is an animal deeply associated with Buddhism. The Arhats are also standing in close relation to Buddhism, particularly Zen. Images of the Arhats can be found in Buddhist temples across Japan. A particular striking display of arhats can be found in Ungan Zenji at the western foot of Mount Kimpo, close to, the, to Kumamoto city in Kyushu. <clears throat> Ungan Zenji is a Buddhist temple of the Soto school of Zen and most well known for its Go Yakurakan, the 500 disciples of Buddha or the 500 Ahats. They are figures of belief and faith but also reminder of human mortality. Different from Buddha, Ahats are still connected to and interact with this world. So in Buddhist belief, the Ahad is an active disciple of Buddha. The Ahad refuses greed, hate and infatuation completely. This is an important Buddhist idea. So in Buddhist belief, every being is responsible for its own action and an Ahad can guide others on the way to enlightenment by teaching the Dharma a code for ethical behavior. So therefore, in Japan, the 16 Ahats are often treated as examples for behavior. <coughs> Sorry. Against their rather emaciated look and their worn-out robes, the Ahats emanate tremendous power of life, uh, power and life experience. So each of them has its supernatural power, but despite of their power and their ability to, br uh, to bring relief, the Ahats usually stay secluded in the mountains and only appear after a disaster like a fire earthquake or tsunami. Knowing the history and potency of the Ahats, Murakami thought them to give relief in times of despair and destruction. They also act as a reminder of the 500 Buddhist sins, which arise from sensual craving and the adherence to the objects and phenomena of this world. This, o this only causes greed, hate, and selfishness. For centuries, people have referred to the Ahats for help and redemption from the 500 sufferings. But next to the seriousness of the topic, you also find a fresh, encouraging, encouraging even playful way in which the Ahats deal with suffering. So surfing or doing Kung Fu are particular examples for the attempt to take things lightly. They encourage to move ahead and fight to overcome hardship. Hope and despair exist side by side in the world we live in. So here you see one of the most impressive Arhats. He's scattering flower petals in front of the great blaze. So with this I come to the second artwork, the flower arrangement of Atsunobu Katagiri. So 
So how does Katagiri's Ikebana support transitions in society? For his artwork, uh, sacrifice the Ikebana of regeneration offered to the future, Katagiri went to the enclosed zone to witness destruction and transformation in the town of Minamizuma. This was important for his artwork. Only there he could capture the sentiment of the region and also the changes of the seasons. At the enclosed zone, Katagiri made flower arrangements only with the material he could find in this area. From his arrangements, he made photographs and put them together with collected stories of the people. For this cover picture, Katagiri was thankful for the snowfall at winter. The snow covered the debris for a while and put the landscape into some resting peace. He could find Narcissi that bloomed despite of the adverse condition. Uh, Katagiri arranged the Narcissi in the cleft of a wooden pole in front of the ocean. Narcissi are also known for their use at the Chinese New Year as a symbol of joy and luck. But we also have a meaning of them. Uh, and they also, in, in like Western or Christian tradition, uh, they also stand for res resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, uh, believed to be extinct, they appear uh, every time again uh, for like Easter celebration. So, they seem to serve as an expression of hope or uh, the, modest, uh, the modest joy that is shown through the cracks. So, uh, gentle transition towards life, you can see here again. So shortly after New Year's Eve, he could find an expensive violinist with withered silver grass. He fixed it to a buoy that he, could, that he could find in a mountain of debris and took the next picture. So the taken photograph is very poetic with the atmospheric coloring of the sky and the peaceful at this time car motion. Interesting is the tripartition of the picture. So you have the high concrete wall which should protect from the ocean. So a protective barrier. Um, then you have a slim stripe of the ocean so at this time very peaceful with a flat surface and an atmospheric sky with a sunset. At first sight the boy looks like a valuable pottery with marks from a drying process. Um, and actually the plant also is not a flower but it is a withered grass he was using here. Uh, so these are references to transients, uh, so we find transitions uh, from, beaut from beauty to danger in this picture. So beauty can only last for a short, a short moment, thereupon tragedy follows. So by contemplating the picture, this yeah, opposing perception is happening re reciprocally. So that means an effect. That means first you see some beauty and then you see some danger, and this is changing. Uh, yeah, back and forth. Like maybe you can compare it a little bit with a picture puzzle. So the plan, with its graceful appearance, virtually stands for transience. It is withered dried up and will disappear pretty soon. So for every picture Katagiri has a specific story, like also for the skull of a two-year-old cow that died of starvation. <coughs> Katagiri decorated the skull with a blossoming Camellia sasanka. He associated the red petal color with the shed blood of the young cow that was spilled. 
The farmer who gave him the skull told him the tragedies that happened after the explosion of the nuclear power plants. He was supposed to kill his cows and leave the contaminated area instantly. But he resisted and stayed with his cows in order to show the country and TEPCO what they have done to their people and environment. At this point, Katagiri thought about the title of his work, Sacrifice. Plants on Earth sacrifice their life to animals and people so that we can live. We owe all our life to them, but we hardly appreciate this. In contrast, we destroy our environment. So in between all the grief, death and losses, Katagiri could also find modest joy in the regeneration of nature. So two years after the disaster, the endangered lagoon flower Misua Oi started to bloom again. Once displaced by large land reclamations, the swamps and lagoons around Minamisuma disappeared. With it, the aquatic plants also vanished. Instead, human population began to grow. On March 11, 2011, the sea engulfed everything and pulled the reclaimed land into the bottom of the ocean. After the ocean calmed down, the lagoons appeared again and with them the flowers came back. This story by a curator of the Fukushima Museum was the inspiration for Katagiri's flower arrangements on the site. So this shows Katagiri's admiration for regeneration of nature or its self-development. In Japanese, you call this shisen, which we would translate into nature. So the term shisen has a vast meaning in Japanese. The characters of shisen consists of the two radicals shi on its own terms, and then meaning yes, correct. So you can translate it as on your own on your own terms, therefore it exists. In Japan, nature has of, uh, nature often is treated as a subject, that means as an independent self. Subject and object form one common reality. Human beings are not superior to nature. So this concept was more worshipped in olden times. This is the reason why Katagiri also used human earthenware for some of his arrangements. Mm. Katagiri could find the Yumon earthenware in the Minamisuma City Museum. While he was doing this ikebana, Katagiri was thinking that he would graft a current life to a life of death. By doing flower arrangements, you also always think about death. You cut the flower but don't want to waste it, so you have to make the most possible beautiful arrangement out of it and keep it alive. So the term ikebana consists of the two words ikeru, alive, and hana, flower. Katagiri thought that flowers arranged in 5,000 year old Yumon pottery form a microcosm of the scheme of nature whereby life is born out of death. Therefore, flowers must intensify their colors and luster. That is what I call ikebana, he says. The conviction came to him by the lives that had disappeared and the flowers that blossomed again. And furthermore, on graves, they also give hope, healing, and consolation. Katagiri, Katagiri thinks that flowers bloom over those lives, 
The colors of flowers are vivid because they collect and emanate countless lives. They teach us how to live. In the summer, some surfers appeared at the beaches of Minamisuma. Katagiri spoke to them for a minute. They said, I quote, I learned how to surf on this beach and I always used to come here to ride the waves. I came here one year after the disaster and got into the sea. I was afraid at first. People told me it's contaminated. But then a big wave came and I swallowed a lot of water. That's when I knew I was prepared to live with the sea. I live here after all. So now I present, uh, present um, this is a rather thesis I want to put into discussion. So from my point of view, but I'm not a philosopher, so uh, you please correct me uh, afterwards in the discussion or please give me some more input. But from my point of view, different philosophical worldviews shine through. Uh, so, To support transitions in society, uh, Murakami refers to the 500 Arhats. So to tradition and Zen Buddhism, that means enlightenment, enlightenment, or you call it also awakening. The Arhats act as moral guidance for human behavior and have supernatural powers. All this rather refers to an anthropocentric worldview, uh, and I just have this definition out of the dictionary, so I don't really discuss these terms. Um, the belief that human beings are the most significant entity of the universe. Mm. Katagiri, however, supports transitions in society through the natural circle of life. So he finds hope in the regeneration of flowers. Everything is alive, like in the Japanese primary religion, the Shinto. He refers to the natural circle of life and death. And even in Shisen, nature is treated as a subject. All this refers to a rather ecocentric worldview. Uh, so a philosophy or perspective that places intrinsic value on all living organisms and their natural environment. So, to conclude, at least three different transitions can be identified. First, the reason for this study, the increasing speed of geophysical transitions in the case of climate change, and the urgent search for mitigation and adaptation options. Second, in my study, this has motivated me to analyze two artists who worked on artworks relating to disasters. So in Murakami's case, he has transitioned to emphasizing tradition and religion, whereas Katagiri has transitioned to highlighting Shisen and the beauty of the natural circle of life. So by analyzing the artist's artworks, I could identify two different philosophical ideas for supporting societal transitions, anthropo anthropocentrism and ecocentrism. And uh, the anthropocentric worldview encourages mitigation, so that means uh, human being can act, moreover is even asked to act to do something. Whereas in the ecocentric worldview, adaptation 
seems to be the key concept. And this means you yeah, maybe cannot do anything about it and has to just endure or live with it, what is happening. So something else will come, maybe the cosmos or whoever will provide an answer. Okay. So I'm happy for any suggestions or comments and I hope I can yeah, answer. So they are both contemporary artists uh, and um, they are both born in Japan but uh, Murakami uh, moved to the US so he's mainly working in the United States. Uh, yes, and uh, uh, first his intention was to uh, maybe explain uh, through his artwork also the, the sentiments of uh, his generation and uh, the Japanese people. Uh, yes, and as I said before, um, when he heard about the, yeah, about the catastrophe in Fukushima, uh, he, was, he, he changed his mind and uh, because at yeah, he first also was, or he still is um, he also criticizing of the world of consumption with his artwork. And now he thinks he just has to support his generation. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, his, he got his idea of the Ahats also because uh, previously there was a picture contest, so between uh, the art historian Tsuchi Nubu and him, that means um, uh, the art historian, he wrote a topic uh, um, a, from Japanese tradition uh, and wrote something <coughs> about this and uh, Murakami answered on this uh, on the next week's issue of the art paper uh, by making a picture. So this is how he first, about this art contest, how he first uh, learned about the Arhats. So he was not also at the beginning not very familiar with maybe really the art historic tradition. So because he is now also still living in the US and working there. And uh, also he's not very accepted or not as much accepted as artists in Japan as he is in the Western world because it is more like a yeah, Western style of yeah, art he's doing. Uh, whereas uh, Katagiri, as I said, he's born in uh, Osaka. Osaka. Uh, and he is, was doing flower arrange arrangements, so he is, um, this is a really traditional art in Japan. So. Uh, this artwork is much more um, yeah, accepted uh, in, in Japan. So, um, <coughs> uh, and maybe also the people understand much better because it's a traditional artwork. So, um, uh, and what he first did was only express his own feelings through the flowers. So maybe we I don't know if you're familiar with Ikebana, so I now, since I live in Japan, I also do Ikebana, so I maybe think, I, I understand a little bit, so you work with the flowers, you see, choose one flower and you look at it and you get a feeling for the flower and while you're doing this artwork, uh, yeah, something of you turns into the flower and the flower turns to you, so uh, this is a very traditional artwork. He first tried to express his own feelings by doing his 
Ikebana and uh, but uh, for this yeah for his artwork for the triple catastrophe he tried to express um, the feelings of the area so that's why he had to empty his what he said his body and mind to yeah, express the feelings of the area Um, first of all, thank you very much to um, present this talk in the early morning on the last day. It's yeah. <laughs> it's uh, half ten here, yeah. and uh, thank you for everybody being here. Yeah. It's kind of respect to stand up uh, after this evening, so thank you very much for this. Yes. Second thing is, um, I would like to ask for a PowerPoint because you brought a lot of pictures in. Um, if you are able to send it, because uh, so I can uh, uh, think further about and look at the pictures and. Because uh, the pictures um, really affected me. Uh, some kind of, for example, the picture called Sacrifice, this idea. Because I remember uh, when I was in, in, I was in Berlin and I saw the, um, uh, the Kamm River uh, in Kyoto completely flooded um, the last one. And I remember my, um, where the, uh, um, the uh, Kamogawa meets the uh, um, uh, Katano Gaba. Uh, the, uh, Turtle stands where the yes. people sit yes. and meet, yeah. and I sat there uh, the whole summer and uh, I thought, uh, uh, I thought, what's happened with my poor turtles? I was stoned, but uh, I realized this idea that uh, um, uh, um, there is a kind of sacrifice uh, when, when the nature uh, comes in. So I uh, really, um, I'm really impressed by this uh, particular um, installation picture. So, um, but what I really want to ask, I don't want to bring any philosophical uh, ideas into account. Um, but I would have to ask you because uh, you have, your talk is a lot of tran uh, transitions between different kind of uh, sciences, uh, so uh, humanities, for example, um, cultural uh, science, philosophy too. But I want to ask you from your point of view, um, what you described remembered me um, from part of art history. Uh, at the um, great um, uh, earthquake in Lissabon in uh, 1765, this one uh, that changed uh, the uh, culture in Europe, the whole enlightenment changed from this um, uh, anthropocentric, uh, reasonable point of view to this uh, more skeptical, more um, um, Kant was influenced by it, the, uh, the music changed, the, the art changed, so it was probably the most uh, uh, powerful um, impact and transition in the European, uh, uh, late European culture from, from nature. So that this one was completely destructed um, and in fact, in fact the whole idea in the late uh, 18th century. So, uh, is there any, uh, you, you mentioned it in your, uh, in your uh, for last uh, uh, paper here, uh, I'll just this uh, slide. slide, yeah. So, um, is there anything from your uh, point, uh, art history point of view to, to say there, we, we can do some kind of transitions too between this European art history and now what changes from, from your point of view in Japanese art? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your question. So the first question I can, uh, yeah, I, yeah, can I point or yeah. So I cannot send you the slides because I have no words on the pictures. Yeah, that's uh, so I that's yeah. problem. So I'm not okay, yeah, allowed to do so. Most, but yeah. we can talk at the break, and then I can maybe yeah, if, if you or maybe you can find catalogs when you can buy. It. Okay. Uh, where you can see the pictures. Uh, or maybe about uh, the arts, you can find pictures in the internet for sure. Uh, Kandili, you probably won't find. Uh, yes, and what you, the second question was if uh, the European big change uh, changed also uh, the art from the Japanese artists, from these two artists, or do you know? No, um, um, uh, uh, this, uh, this was great, and this one changed the, the European culture completely. Yes. Um, and my question is, uh, do you see from this uh, triple 
if there is a complete change, uh, not a complete one, but you mentioned this uh, ecocentric and anthropocentric uh, thing um, that was the same in, in Europe uh, mm -hmm. uh, just, at the end of the uh, 19th century. So my question is, do you see um, some, from the artistry point of view, uh, some kind of um, relations, some kind of transitions? Well, it's difficult to say because um, I know. Yeah, I, I, I cannot say. So uh, I mean, there are always transitions going on for sure, and I, I think, and yeah, we can also hope that there will be some transitions and that uh, people will change. And this is also why I'm working on this topic right now because. Um, yeah, we, we need big changes. So, um, uh, yeah, and also political changes. So, in July, I went to uh, a conference about this topic uh, in uh, Newcastle in Australia. So, this was uh, the narratives, they called it the narratives of climate change. And there came many scientists together to talk about this topic. And this um, was initiated by the uh, law school of uh, Newcastle University. And uh, the lawyers gave uh, presentations about climate change. Uh, economists gave presentations. But they also invited many um, yeah, scientists from the humanities because uh, the lawyers said, uh, we cannot change anything anymore. We have all scientific uh, evidences about climate change, but we cannot do more laws. So, um, so we need the help from humanities because we have to need, uh, we have to change uh, yeah, the thinking of the people about democracy, so the people have to vote, they have to vote for the right parties that we can make a change. Uh, so that's why they also invited many people from uh, also from humanities uh, and they said we now need um, narratives. That means we need narratives uh, from yeah, art history, I call them pictures, so we can learn from tradition and from history. Uh, this is, we can learn how they reacted to it, like you just mentioned. But uh, why we also need them, and this is what they emphasize, is to bring this narrative, so this scientific, uh, yes, scientific knowledge we have to bring it back to society. So this is very important because if we talk about this in our close circle, only within the scientists, the public will not understand, and then they don't vote, and then we don't have any changes, and the lawyers cannot do anything, and the politicians can, the politicians can only do something if the people vote for the right party. So that's why this is very, very important that we have, or that we yeah, have these narratives. This is not only um, pictures or art, it's also literature, stories, uh, that the people can believe in something. So we have to find a way how to bring this back to, to the public. Uh, and um, yeah. yeah, I could say many I'm totally fine with the answer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. And as you mentioned, the power of, of let's say art in the broadest sense to change the mindset public. Um, you, you were thinking about some re or some some evocation of anthropocentrism and ecocentrism through the artworks of those two um, artists and um, mentioned that both of them kind of tried to get a new grip of Japanese traditions, traditional narratives, to bring them up again, to give hope and to give an orientation for um, currently living people. And I just wonder at this um, instance, um, there's, there's a lot to say about Japanese and aesthetics, because aesthetics are somehow 
linked to, associated with Japanese identity, Japanese culture, but there's also the, the critique implicit that the modern Japanese society lost itself in aestheticization. So that, uh, like Superflat also indicates that there's nothing more than, than beautiful pictures and an and outside. Um, and I simply wonder what you think about if, if this, this new, let's say, movement um, really gets into the deep, really um, into the depth, really um, triggers some more thoughtful engagement with what happened, or if it is just another aestheticization of, of a catastrophe. So uh, not really a reflection upon it, not really um, a going back to, to traditional thoughts, but just another attempt to um, approach these, 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 these changes by aesthetics and nothing more. Yes, this is what I first thought, and this is also why I started to do my research. And these are uh, really, I mean, I'm not working very long on this topic. So, um, but this was my first thinking, um, how do they react now on this catastrophe? And uh, first, or one title for one presentation uh, I gave uh, on a conference was um, uh, uh, it was um, uh, something like um, I forgot. <laughs> I forgot to uh, yeah. So it was like um, devastation. Um, the the reaction with beauty. So you, so uh, this is what. Yeah, I also try to find out that there is maybe only a, just a different way uh, to point out something in the Japanese yeah, culture. So, um, in European culture, we are very loud and expressive and have to point out things we don't like. So, we would, I don't know if this is the same we have in English, but we will point the finger to the yeah the mistake of wound and um, I first thought well Japanese people don't care about this anymore but I think they just have a different way to to uh, care about this a more subtle way a more sensitive way uh, to express their feelings. And this is the problem maybe we have that we don't really understand it maybe or we don't really see it because it is so subtle that we just don't understand. And this is what I also maybe I want to try to make a research project out of this that I also would like to compare how, how did or do the Western artists um, make artworks about this catastrophe and how Japanese people. Mm -hmm. And you already saw a difference um, in uh, Murakami's approach. He's living in the US and this was like more like very with this colors and this size, like a very I would say loud reaction. Um, and also the media um, is a rather uh, Western media he used with this acrylic painting. Um, but he referred to Japanese tradition. So uh, this was also what I found very interesting. And on the other hand, um, uh, Katagiri's approach was, or is more uh, subtle and uh, the Western person, if you would look at the picture at the first time, maybe you would not understand what you see there. Yeah. But I also found out that uh, I just told a friend of mine that I would give this presentation, and he was asked, or he asked, yeah, what is it about? And I just showed him. So he is Japanese. I showed him the catalogs, and he was not 
interested in the arts, but he looked at the catalogue from Katagiri and he was almost starting to cry. Mm -hmm. So he understood this instantly, whereas he could not understand the arts and the Yeah, it's just colorful pictures and I don't know if I answered to your question. Yes. I have a one thing. Um, I'm just so sure if I'm not mm -hmm. so old, but the third part is that you have the slide, I think, uh, before this or before this, I don't know. Um, this one? Yeah. yeah. belief but you also have Shinto belief and Confucian belief mm -hmm. so and they are all kind of merged together mm -hmm. um, but anyway you can find some different roots mm -hmm. and I tried to find out mm -hmm. uh, some kind of, some uh, different yeah S let's see some kind of different uh, aspects of these religions and you also differentiate between a Buddhist temple and a, uh, and a Shinto shrine. Uh, even though in every religion you have uh, some influence on the other religion. Mm. And why, so your question is also why I did this differentiation? Mm. So why I did this is the first thing that I thought that I can see some different approaches and some different reactions. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know if the, I have this, so Katagiri also, uh, yeah, he also said when he first saw this, that this catastrophe, he had some kind of happy feeling uh, because he thought, okay, now nature is um, mm -hmm. taking back what maybe human beings was taking from nature. And the, only the second thought was, oh my god, many people are dying and it's a really, uh, yeah, a big problem. And then we also had like this, um, like on the last slide, uh, <coughs> no, it was, 
So the surfers who went back into the sea and they knew it's contaminated, but they thought, well, I'm not different from the sea. I'm not better or above the sea. So this is my natural environment. So I belong to this. Uh, so when the ocean is contaminated, I'm also contaminated. And uh, I think this is a typical ecocentric view. Uh, so, um, and the problem is that yeah, when when you think that yeah everything is the same, you also cannot and and that that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I um, for example, uh, maybe we can. Uh, it's maybe the question of articulation of the or formulation, maybe. Um, yeah. Maybe you want to say something like um, um, maybe because of this uh, there is the tradition and mixed with Zen Buddhism and uh, Confucianism and of course Shintoistic Centralism and so on. Um, I have the feeling that the, for example this uh, painter, mm -hmm. I don't know mm -hmm. of this uh, Aha. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. Um, he sees like uh, we people are all, uh, already always uh, parts of nature. So mm -hmm. uh, as uh, how to say that? As once the let's say um, the dinosaurs live and they disappear, like uh, because of nature's change, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes we people uh, can be a kind of how to say that? Um, of uh, mm -hmm. of the. Uh, and um, but if you say like if uh, it's a uh, ecocentrism, I don't know that um, uh, maybe I have a bit kind of problem with the word center also because in when I think of the view what this uh, painter would have, he is not the center. People are not the center. And nature is also the center, but nature is not the center, mm -hmm. which is outside of me or outside, or which is uh, separated from me, from us, from people. Because we people are also in this center as nature. That's why maybe he found it nice, or he found it good, that the nature made an expression yes. of himself. Yes. So, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. maybe. Uh, I'm very sorry because uh, I thought your presentation was uh, yeah, uh, so completely yeah. uh, your presentation, but because I saw the, the, the last slide, I asked you just one thing. Uh, probably you know uh, the French philosopher Jean Luc Nancy wrote uh, for me a very important paper about Fukushima entitled The Equivalence of Catastrophes, I think. And uh, for him, the point is that Fukushima is uh, terrifying and monstrous because the, the distinction, the traditional distinction between nature and uh, anthropocentric or artificial world uh, collapsed. So uh, for him, it's impossible to distinguish. So, is Fukushima a natural disaster or a, a disaster produced by uh, human beings? Uh, or is this question, this problem, uh, meaningless? Because you cannot distinguish anymore if uh, it, it is the tsunami or it is the nuclear, uh, it's a, the nuclear accident made by human or by nature. So, uh, I ask you uh, to explain me better because really I think that in the case of Fukushima, the distinction between anthropocentric and ecocentric uh, doesn't work at all. And therefore, Fukushima is new, is a new uh, kind of catastrophe that never happened before, and we have no categories. So it's not a question to produce a new narration. Is a question to produce new concepts because we have no concept to think of Fukushima. So, what do you think about? 
Yes, that's, that's so true what, what you're saying. So uh, I, I only refer to the arguments I was talking about. And there, uh, for my opinion, so I'm only art historian, so I'm also not very much deep into this discussion, but that's also why I put this slide into discussion. Uh, it, it was only in the Argus itself that I could find this distinction. So I was not referring to the catastrophe itself. And um, I also, um, I have to say, I also mix up uh, natural catastrophes and human-made catastrophes also in my presentation. So uh, in the case of the catastrophes, I made no distinctions. I only referred to the artworks. So, so I started my um, presentation actually about a climate change as a geophysical transition, and this is a man-made uh, change. So there we're uh, aware that we are doing it. So we can clearly say that it's an anthropocentric uh, or man-made uh, change. But we also have natural catastrophes. But this is not, I think, I don't try to differentiate between this because uh, we will face more and more catastrophes. Uh, if it's a, a, yeah, like a tsunami or uh, a flooding. Uh, so I just want to see the output. How, uh, how are the people dealing with it? when uh, they are faced with these catastrophes. So right at the, now at the point of my research, so I, uh, I, I don't differentiate between this. And this is only the outcome of uh, the, this description of the artworks and interpretation of the different artworks. So how these two artists uh, dealt with this catastrophe. Um, sorry, uh, uh, so I want to ask a second question. Um, uh, I thought about uh, doing um, the discussion. Um, recently I talked with uh, uh, Danny Torsen about um, metaphysics. And he said to me, in a culture uh, where the ground is not stable, um, people do not uh, tend to in, uh, uh, deal with kind of uh, substantial metaphysics like in the West, where they don't trust in the ground. Uh, they don't trust in some kind of fundamentation this way but in the Western philosophy. Um, and so my question to you as an artist is it the same in in um, in art too. Yes. Is kind of um, dealing with the inevitable changing of the, of everything in nature, society. So it's yes. the same. So you, you can definitely you can find this when you look at, uh, uh, I would say, European art and Japanese art. So you can find it, in, uh, for instance, in architecture. So in the buildings uh, in Japan, the traditional buildings, they are very light buildings. So uh, with um, yeah, the, the paper walls and the thatched roof. So uh, in the case of, for instance, an um, earthquake, uh, that you don't have, I mean, all the times, so much damage when it's collapsed. But you also see it in, like, in European, we have, like, huge oil paintings. You would not find this in Japan, uh, because um, in the case of uh, an earthquake, uh, it would disappear. So, uh, so that's why you have, for instance, paper, uh, paper scrolls. So, uh, if you have to move or something is happening, uh, they can very fast uh, roll it up and put it in the like, tube, uh, and then it is safe. So you have very small artworks. Or you have artworks. Yes, that artworks, usually you don't put them in a museum. So uh, this is why you have, I would not talk about artworks, it's like, art forms, different art forms, like uh, for, for instance Ikebana, it's a very, uh, <coughs> you make it and it lasts for, yeah, maybe if you do it very good for four weeks and then it's gone. 
Yeah, so um, that's the same with tea ceremony. So um, the, this is a very high art form in Japan. And there you look at all uh, of the you know, precious small art things. Uh, and the gathering itself, you can understand this um, art itself. So you would compare it maybe to yeah, today's art forms like performances or happenings. So you have this ceremony and the whole ceremony itself is art. And when the ceremony is over, it is gone, not really gone, because everybody is taking, what, uh, is taking something with him or herself. And even the people who practice it understand themselves maybe as people of art, art people. Uh, so they try to train to become an art person. So it's a very different kind of art you can find. And I would say that this is also because of the yeah, earthquakes or natural catastrophes you can find in Japan also. Really. Thank you very much. Thank you. The role pictures we also have in China, so um, isn't an influence from China? Is, uh, yes. yes, definitely. So yes. that yes. Yes. And you still think that it has an influence? Uh, the, the earthquake uh, danger is an influence on such artworks? Yeah, well, I think you can put them away and also if you travel, so I don't know so much about the art history in China, but for Japan I would say, uh, even though they might adapt to it, uh, this is also the reason why they have maybe a role and not like the huge art or paintings. And maybe not huge Chinese places with the vases or so. <laughs> Thank you very much um, yeah, for the rich presentation and the discussion. Uh, we have actually five minutes till the end, but uh, Thank you.